Before I invite uh, Mark Plick to, from Foley and Lardner to, to come join me here at, at the lectern, I want to share with you that, that next generation manufacturing is a subject that we've been following over the last 12 months with the help of Foley and Lardner. Additive manufacturing is one of the most disruptive technologies facing industry today and, and in a very positive way. The convergence of manufacturing and technology from smart vehicles to just-in-time product printing is truly changing the playing field for American companies and I, and I think the future looks quite bright. The environment for funding manufacturing is also undergoing significant changes with public-private partnerships in the forefront as America seeks to solidify its global position as a leader in this new arena. This panel led by Michael Plicht of, of Foley will explore the new world order that's taking Unbelt shape. After all. And with you that, I'll invite uh, yeah. Mark to come to the lectern to introduce his group. Thank you. And we're going to, are we? So we're uh, still assembling a little bit here, but. Just in um, time. <coughs> I mean, uh, my name is Mark Plicht. I'm a M&A and securities attorney at Foley and Larder. First, we have uh, Neil Karolik. He's the president of TLX Technologies, which uh, designs and manufactures <coughs> solenoids for a variety of inter industries and customers, including automotive OEMs and Tier 1 and Tier 2 suppliers. We have Jonathan Rauner, uh, the international head of M&A at Nomura, one of the world's leading investment banks. Uh, we have Madhu uh, Bupaluri, president and CEO of S um, SR Steel Minnesota LLC, which is building a state-of-the-art open pit mining, uh, concentrating and pelletizing plant. Uh, we have Bernard uh, Ziskovich, uh, who is the uh, CEO and founder of Ziskovich Architects, an architecture firm that runs the spectrum from transportation to schools, uh, commercial to public-private partnerships, to recreational and master plans for cities. And last but certainly not least, we have Bob Fitzsimmons, managing partner High Road Capital Partners, a private equity firm focused on buying and building leading companies at the smaller end of the middle, middle market. While we are going to talk about manufacturing, this is an M&A conference, so we'll start by talking about the state of M&A, in particular the manufacturing area. Jonathan, what is the state of play? Uh, good morning. So a little practice in just-in-time delivery here in my own arrival. Um, so as we, as, as I think this audience knows well, to set the context for M&A and the role of manufacturing in it, the M&A environment, the M&A market is at record levels, uh, driven in large part by growth here in the U.S., where we're on track to exceed $2 trillion of M&A activity this year, almost 25 to 30 percent higher than last year. And while the big deals in pharma and technology are grabbing the headlines, consolidation in manufacturing remains a vital part uh, and a consistent part of M&A activity year from year. It represents somewhere from 15 to 20 percent of total M&A activity year in and year out. And activity, M&A activity in the manufacturing sector it's really driven fundamentally by globalization. As companies look to cut costs, look to acquire uh, market share and broaden their scope globally, look to acquire new technologies and new brands and able to compete more effectively on a global scale. One of our panelists here will talk about the automotive industry. It's a great example of those basic trends. It's an industry that a generation ago was a series of regional oligopolies. Lived in the US, you'd buy a car from the big three. If you lived in France, you'd buy a Renault or a Peugeot. If you lived in Germany, you'd buy a Mercedes or an Audi. Uh, today, obviously, all these companies are global. Look on the streets of New York City and you see products from all around the world. And the companies that make them and the companies that supply them have to be global. And um, what we've seen is M&A used as a tool to supply those global companies, dramatic consolidation among automotive suppliers, and consolidation driven by acquisition of brands. Land Rover and Jaguar is my favorite example. Land Rover, an iconic English brand uh, it's now owned by Tata of India. In 
and Todd is just building a new plant in China to build Land Rovers in China. Uh, so dramatic change in how these products are manufactured, uh, how they're supplied. Another factor that's driving all that activity is the convergence of manufacturing and technology. Not just in um, products that have a lot of embedded technology like electronics, but even in basic manufactured goods, in washing machines, in cars, um, in basic durable goods. A long-standing client of mine, TRW Automotive, just uh, sold the company for $13 billion to a European competitor, in large part for that competitor to get access to new safety technologies which TRW manufactures and are increasingly important in uh, the manufacturing of new vehicles. So we expect the basic trends in M&A to continue. It's a very robust market and the forces driving it we see continuing for the near term. Um, within the industrial base, M&A will continue to be used as a vital tool for companies to compete more successfully around the world on a global basis. Thanks, Jonathan. Bob, obviously, Jonathan gave us the, the overall view of M&A, but from the private equity standpoint, is there a private equity interest in, in manufacturing companies, and what's driving that interest? Yeah, there's a, a tremendous amount of interest in manufacturing right now, uh, and it is a great time to invest in manufacturing. Um, just, uh, you know, glo uh, in terms of global trends, uh, and if you look at what's going on in the U.S., um, all, all the energy that has been uh, developed and freed up by virtue of uh, fracking and other technologies has dramatically reduced uh, energy costs, um, you know, heating, uh, electricity, um, you know, costs all much more reasonable than they used to be. That's helping uh, bring manufacturing back into the U.S. Uh, that combined with um, better wage competitiveness, uh, not because of wage declines in the U.S., but uh, be because of wage increases offshore, particularly in China. Um, it was estimated a few years ago that the wage, uh, hourly wage gap uh, in manufacturing was roughly $17 an hour, uh, U.S. versus China. I've seen recent estimates that it's closer to $7 an hour. Uh, with that, um, the manufacturing becomes much more competitive in the U.S. And then you combine that with an economic environment where you've got a reasonable GDP growth, um, you know, 4% uh, two quarters ago, 3.5% uh, last quarter. You know, people predicting sort of 25 3% uh, this year and next. Um, you know, a good uh, stable growth climate, uh, low interest rates, plenty of credit available. Um, all of which makes for a great general uh, investment environment uh, for uh, manufacturing in the U.S. So turning to, to some of the people who are really are the operators here, you know, uh, in particular Madhu, you have uh, your company is in the midst of a $1.8 billion uh, greenfield uh, project in northern Minnesota. I believe it's supposed to come online in 2015. And, you know, so tell us a little bit about that project and, you know, government support for that. How is that? How has that worked for, uh, for you? Sure, Mark. Uh, in the backdrop of the m &A's sort of uh, discussion we are having here, I should also cover how we have entered in this space in North America. I've been here in the U.S. for the past 16 years, and as a group, I'm talking about as SR, we have entered and used m &A as a tool for us to enter North America. And we have in all bought five assets between U.S. and Canada. And we have invested more than $5 billion in the space of metals and mining. Uh, two of those five assets are greenfield projects. So three others are operating assets. Uh, one is a steel plant in Sault Ste. Marie, which was an operating steel plant we have acquired in Algoma. Uh, the name of the steel plant is Algoma, SR Steel Algoma in Canada. That's a $1.7 billion acquisition. Alongside uh, the Sault Ste. Marie operating steel plant, we have developed the port as well as a cogeneration plant, power plant, which is a greenfield project we have developed there. So in all, in Canada, we have invested more than $2.7 billion. And as a sequel to that, we have invested a similar amount, close to about $2 plus billion in US. Uh, one is uh, in metallurgical coal in West Virginia, which is an operating mine, and the the project which you are talking about in Minnesota, where we are now developing a $1.8 billion greenfield, largest uh, greenfield project right now being developed in North America in metals and mining space. 
the capacity of uh, the project is about 7 million tons of pellets, which we are going to be producing in a place called Nashwalk in northern Minnesota. And uh, we have just completed the full financing of the project about a couple of months ago. So we are uh, in full swing uh, to get to the production by end of next year to produce 7 million tons. And that particular product will go into the blast furnaces in US and Canada for making steel, which eventually will cater to the end market such as automobiles, refrigerators, washing machines, or infrastructure projects such as bridges and tunnels. So we are very excited to be in the space of metals and buying within North America through all these initiatives. So you've um, obviously done a lot of projects with, you know, with greenfield projects. How important is it, is it to have a partner in, with government, whether it be for financing or for permitting or other issues? And has, has that been a successful relationship for you? It's an extremely important element. Uh, clearly, uh, we are talking about big numbers here in terms of dollars. And then you are committing large capital, such as uh, what I have talked about in the state of Minnesota, or for that matter, in Ontario. We would need the support of not, no, not only the government, but also the local community uh, and, uh, and the teams around, uh, whether it's cities, state, counties. So we have worked extremely closely with all these different functionaries in the state hierarchy in the state of Minnesota, or elected representatives like state senators and state representatives and so on and so forth. So extremely important to have the support of the state, not necessarily purely in terms of dollars for developing infrastructure which is needed for these projects to become successful, but also to create the conducive environment, such as what you've talked about, the permitting uh, sort of uh, environment for us to move ahead and invest large sums of money. So it's an extremely important aspect. Um, historically, the U.S. has had a very skilled uh, manufacturing labor force. Um, as it, our manufacturing base has shrunk, that has gone away to a certain degree, especially in certain skilled trades. How do you make sure that you have the people that you need and with the training that you need uh, for your facilities? I think it's a very, very important question, Mark, you've raised. Uh, clearly, what you said in the first part of your question or statement is right, that the U.S. is, for the matter, North America should have uh, logically very talented uh, pool of uh, labor. Uh, but unfortunately, as all of us are aware here, the manufacturing has been uh, on decline in some ways, uh, with service industry taking much more larger space in uh, this part of the world. And uh, just as a way of an example, I can say, the project we are now constructing in the state of Minnesota, the SR Steel Minnesota, which is a pellet plant, I had no pellet plant, is being constructed after 1977. There is no pellet plant constructed on the Iron Range. So we are constructing essentially after 40 years a brand new project. So therefore, the type of expertise needed to build such projects or operate modern projects or modern plants such as what we are building needs, again, retraining of local teams and local uh, sort of personnel, which is, which is very important. We can put dollars to work but they can't really ultimately generate uh, any results unless you have people who are well equipped to operate those uh, sort of advanced machinery. So I think we are getting there. So we, we participate extensively in the local community to identify what are the tools to retrain or build the appropriate talent. Bernard, kind of a, uh, as we segue from you know, having the right people and finding the right people and keeping them, um, you know, last week when we talked, you mentioned some of the modern, I'll call them cultural issues uh, that large manufacturers and other companies have. And you know, how, um, how can you make operations in the large organizations, including manufacturing companies, uh, something that is relevant to millennials? <clears throat> See, uh, if you're talking about cultures, am I right? That's the question you had? Yeah, yeah. I think he was asking me, but go, go right ahead. No, please go ahead. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I don't, I don't want to talk. You can both please. answer it. So Go right ahead. <laughs> well, I could only mention because I thought probably the question was addressed to me, so I'll just take a minute to explain. <laughs> Coming from different culture, I thought that could be a question for me. Yeah. Uh, clearly, of course, we have to work within, within the local sort of environment, and we have had the pleasure of integrating both uh, Eastern culture, if I may say, coming from India, and Western culture. Uh, and we have a large number of people exchanging uh, between locations, being uh, tra traveling. And we have had an excellent uh, sort of track here. I'll pause there. Well, I think we're all in a way from a different culture, in a sense. Um, certainly, 
there's, there's something happening in the world now which I'm noticing on a trend level, which is that, that the people who are interested in working are not interested in working in the same way as they used to. And I think that's really the point because um, as an architect, in some respects, I'm, I'm not sure why I'm in this conference, um, but, but from the standpoint of Selig and Mark, when we were speaking, you, you raised a good point, which is that in the buying of companies, you're also buying the access to the people that work in the companies. And, and in that respect, it really is a humanist endeavor, and it's important to understand what drives people. And from my perspective, from what I'm seeing, is there's a shift in the dedication that used to be in other generations of, of, a, of a job for life and to be taken care of by the corporation that supports you into much more a, an environment comprised mostly of freelancers. So when people criticize millennials that they're not invested, they're not willing to pay their dues, all the things that we might say about our own children or grandchildren, depending on the age, um, I think that that's not really correct. My, my, my sense is that what they have is a value system that leads them into a different direction, uh, predominantly in two ways. They, they really want to have a shared economy, meaning that they are very happy working by themselves or possibly with a couple of others, but they want to be surrounded by 500 people in the same space that can work in the same context. So, there's a whole new industry of companies like WeWork, like Etsy, that are taking advantage of the social space that is driving a lot of the people in their interaction. And I think the second is people are driven by experience. So whereas somebody used to save for the fancy car, this generation doesn't want any car. They want to save for the experience of having a great trip or possibly leaving work for unheard of amounts of time because they have an opportunity to go have some other experience. So the value system is different. And if we're going to have successful companies that engender loyalty, I think it's very important to also begin to think about what does that mean to, um, to people in terms of the flexibility for their personal lives. So I think that production could go up. There still could be flexibility for individuals but it needs to be designed and it needs to be formulated in a way where there's a certain amount of controls. Otherwise, I think it's going to be hard to draw people to stay in one company for any, really, for any long time. Well, it just seems to me, and, and this is very anecdotally, it's, uh, but, you know, my generation, I was, a, you know, Gen X, and we were all a bunch of slackers and we weren't motivated as well, and that was what we, the, the, the story. And I think that kind of impression changed over time, at least I, I hope it is, as right. a lot of us. But this does seem, because as you point out, it's more of, it goes beyond just a behavior issue to kind of a value system, which seems to me to be more sticky and more likely to, you know, to last and, and not just change as people just get older and all of a sudden have to, you know, have, you know, if, if, you, if you don't want a car, then you're not going to be worried about car payments five years from now. It's well, I think the point is, like, by example, where our headquarters is Miami, we have an office here in New York. Um, we've started interacting with, with a couple of companies. Um, by example, one is WeWork, which is, seems to me pretty well positioned to be growing in a significant way. What's amazing is that if you're in real estate and you want a big office tenant, a 50,000 square foot user, they've always been just the big law firms uh, or a bank. Uh, now there's a million and a half square feet in this city comprised of, of, of companies that are, that is one company, WeWork, and they take down 70 to 100,000 square feet at a time. And you know their users? You're limited. You, they sell by the desk. It's two people in a room, four, six, eight, or 10. And if you want up to 20, they can accommodate you. But what they're really selling is not space. That's the whole thing. They're selling access through social media, through networking, through interconnections, and if you're not really aware of what's going on, there is an entire other level of communication happening among people that is just not visible uh, within the ordinary context of running a company. You, people have no idea how much other communication is going on at the same time. And it's driving business, and it's driving people's desire to acquire, but what they want to acquire is not what you're offering them. They want to acquire something that they discover for themselves. So it's a very different paradigm. 
we're going to shift gears a little bit and uh, get back to, uh, to a little more of the hardcore manufacturing. And Neil, uh, you know, that is something you are obviously very much involved in. Um, many of us have read and, and discussed how there's a renaissance in U.S. manufacturing. That's part of our discussion here in, in this panel and others. But your Wisconsin-based manufacturing company uh, has recently expanded into China. Um, you know, what drove the decision to put operations in China, and how has that process worked for your company? Well, much like uh, I think Robert brought up, <clears throat> excuse me, um, automobiles, car manufacturer, a lot of hard goods manufacturer, if it's not Starbucks, and no offense to Starbucks, their, their locale is maybe in Manhattan, 20 feet, but in Wisconsin, it's, you know, it's five miles. Um, you have to participate in that market if you're a hard goods manufacturer. GM, Ford go over to China. It's one of their biggest markets they have. And if you can't supply them parts in the U.S. and provide them parts in Europe and provide them parts in China, they have very little uh, motivation, desire to have you provide them parts. Um, uh, consequently, we put a facility in China, not for export, which many people did years ago. We put it in China specifically to handle supply to the automotive market in China. Um, the Chinese car market, the Dongfeng, the Cherry, the Great Wall, are certainly still in China and certainly still trying to even look at supplying that market and export. They primarily export to third world countries. We have some limitations that GM and, and Chrysler and GM, uh, uh, automobile manufacturers in the U.S. to supply to em Emirates Republic or Iraq. But believe it or not, when the Chinese people buy their cars, they buy predominantly a GM or a Volkswagen or Fiat. Those are the three highest selling vehicles in China at this particular time. That's not to take any, anything away from the Chinese car manufacturers, but like all of us out here, nine times out of 10, when you wanna buy a product and you wanna assure yourself that it's the best you can get and you're spending your money, strangely enough, even the Chinese people, which again, a lot of people seem are price, 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 they buy a product that is designed and manufactured usually by a Western manufacturer. Maybe the second car is a dung fung or a cherry, but the first one is usually in that uh, uh, Western genre manufactured car or product. So for us, it was paramount as we build the business, as small as we are in Wisconsin. Um, I came from Johnson Controls. I certainly knew how that market worked. We had to start to participate in that market and go after it and follow our customers over there, or everything we have would potentially be in jeopardy. Now, you've um, you set up operations in China. Have you been pushed to put, set up operations in other locales, like in Europe? So far, we haven't. Uh, we export to Europe, Singapore, Thailand, a lot of different markets. We really haven't been pushed very much to set up in Europe. Um, I, I will say that it's not something out of the question, but the reality is right now, most products from the United States can be serviced to Europe in a very competitive situation because of the exchange rates and, and what's the European structure that is in, yeah, for manufacture. That may change, but at this particular moment, that seems we provide Mercedes. There's no talk about Mercedes telling us to put a product or a manufacturing plant in that country. I mean, just to kind of wrap up the, the topic, I mean, does it, is it fair to say that when people talk about reshoring and offshoring and what's, what's happening next, there's really no one size fits all answer no, I, I would agree there isn't. Uh, I, I will say, again, uh, echoing what Robert said, the uh, labor rates in other countries, as they become economically viable, as their standard of living goes up, it's invariable that their cost and their uh, labor cost will go up. China is no longer making garments. It's mostly Indonesia, it's mostly India. Uh, and then it'll push to some other. I always kind of use the analogy, I don't know how many people are car people, but a lug nut is a very simple machine part on a car. If you had your way to m most effectively manufacture a lug nut, you'd rent an aircraft carrier, put a bunch of CNC machines on it, and move it to any port where you got the lower labor rate for the day. That's <laughs> kind of what's happening with garments and other industries, big pens, no offense if anyone, anyone here invested in big pens. Uh, but on a technology level, on something that has to be custom designed, you have to be on site and support that customer. When GM has an issue, they don't want to wait six hours for an answer. Shifting gears a bit, um, one of, the, you know, one of the, the names of this panel is additive manufacturing, which is 
a little bit, you know, traditionally manufacturing is reductive where you take a piece, let's, a piece of metal, you cut it, you put holes in it, and you, you, you fabricate it, and you end up with a product. But we keep hearing about this added manufacturing. Can you talk a little bit about what it is and then uh, and explain you know, kind of where it is as far as at your company and where you see it going? You're talking about 3D printing? 3D printing, yes. Um, again, uh, no, no uh, cut against big pens, but many items that 3D manufacturer allows to be made right now, if anyone's mostly familiar, basically a printer that prints out a 3D image or a 3D product. Uh, for prototyping, it works great. For plastic parts, it's very good. Uh, plastic parts that have to be extremely durable, questionable. They now can do some zinc materials and some stainless materials. So far, not steel, not ferrite that I know of. But even at that point, um, we as human beings in my market can destroy a car more innovatively than any engineer can think of. So therefore, making something off a printer that isn't, doesn't have the durability to sit on a vehicle is very difficult. So the horizon of actually printing out a part that then goes into a car is, is a, I think, a ways off. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'd be a fool to say that. But on plastic pieces, on some consumer plastic pieces, I think it's very close. Well, and for those who are maybe not familiar with the technology, and I'm certainly no expert, but basically you have these tiny pieces of plastic or or metal, depending on what, what kind of application you're doing, and it, you use a laser or, or some other technologies to sort of melt certain pieces of them together, and the rest of the, it just blows away. So what you're left with is you slowly add layers to a, a structure, and you can imagine how, uh, first of all, it is the coolest process you ever want to see. If you get a chance, to, you know, take a look at this at, uh, if you get a, a tour. But the other thing is you can really, um, there's a lot of flexibility in what you can create, and if you can imagine, like, the lead times for this are, are very short. And so it's, it's really, if we ever get to the point where we can manufacture with this, it would be a game changer. But we're, way, we're so. ways off on, on that. Well, again, on high durability parts, but I think on some consumer products. Absolutely. It, it's probably fairly close. And, okay. and I think you are starting to see it in a little bit in medical uh, implants, hip implants, uh, aerospace, where you've got a high degree of machining, tremendous amount of material loss, you know, some parts start with a block of material and 90% of it is, uh, you know, is lost in the, in the process of whittling it down to the final part. So uh, you do see it a little bit more in aerospace uh, and medical than you do yeah. in general in manufacturing medical, at this point. The customizability of it is really important. <laughs> Correct. You, can, you know, so, there's, a, there's another use too. I use it in our firm. Um, the, if you look at some of the most creative lighting fixtures coming out, if you look at other things where you have literally an impossible fabrication because something is embedded and layered within something else, you can actually make those things with a 3D printer. There's no seam, there's no other process, it just comes up at one time. Uh, if it's like a ball joint, you can design the printer to leave the space by the time it comes out of the printer, the ball joint's already in place and it operates. I think it's an opportunity for innovation that doesn't exist in normal manufacturing. Absolutely. We thank you very much. We thank the panel very much. And uh, I guess enjoy your lunch.